Everybody seems to be happy, everybody talking to each other. That's a church family, isn't it, folks? Well, again, good morning and welcome, everybody, especially to our visitors. We hope that you will come again and this will be possibly your home church. So we have some announcements for you, which we're going to do first. Uh, I just want you to take special notice in your bulletins about the first reading. Uh, if you can look those names over, and then next week we will have, um, we will have the vote on that. We want to remind you that there's still a prayer ministry every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And um, if you can come, make the time, come on over and pray and talk about the Lord. We all need prayer, don't we? Every one of us. And let's see here. Also, we're having um, uh, the bookmobile, or what you would call they would have food. It is coming to our church on September 18th, and there's information for you on the, in the bulletin. You can call in for an order, and then you can come here and pick it up so that you don't have to drive to Orlando or somewhere else to pick that all up. Um, we also want to remind you that the church ministry surveys are still around. Uh, you can pick some up at the back um, in the foyer there. And if you'd like to volunteer uh, to do some things in our church, our church ministries, please fill out your name and on the other side, mark it off what you'd like to help with. Also, you'll find in front of your pews prayer request cards. We invite you to fill them out, and then when we have prayer, when Marjorie has prayer for us, she'll ask for those cards, and they'll be prayed for through the week and in weeks to come. So please remember that. And I also encourage you just to read over the bulletin. There's a lot of information for you and um, for us to consider. So at this time, I need to, um, we're having a special request today. It's a financial request to help a church member at our church. Her name is Le Lamisha, I'm sorry, Lemonisha Adams. Um, some, I'm sure most of you know who she is. And uh, she and her family has been members of our church for many years. Lemonisha has attended our school uh, across the street. She's been in Pathfinders Club and just very involved. Lemonisha is uh, a senior this year at North Tampa Christian Academy, which is an Adventist school not too far from us here in Wesley Chapel. And she has been attending there ever since she left our school here from eighth grade. She went there from ninth grade on, and she's been attending there. And um, so what it is, she, would, she is in her senior year this year, and um, she needs some financial help from us as a church at large here. Um, she is a straight A student. I mean, I saw her grades. Every subject, every grade is all straight A's. I'm sure better than what mine was. But um, anyways, and it's not only she has straight A's, but she um, is active in all the sports there and, and activities that is there. In fact, I was talking to the principal, uh, Stephen Herr, and he said that she's a model student there at the school. So the, the request is, um, that Lemonisha is needing financial help of $4,500 to finish up this year. And her parents are helping, the school is helping a great deal, and also our church has helped, and also a few uh, private people has helped, and even the government has helped. But she's still short of $4,500. So. I was just wondering if it is in your heart, in your minds, if you could help uh, with her to finish up her senior year. Um, and how this can be done is you can write out a check and just mark it North Tampa Christian Academy. And when our Treasury Department receives it, uh, they'll send it right to the school and or you can send it to the school directly in your bulletin there is the address of the school, North Tampa Christian Academy. I don't know if I said this, but for those of you who don't know, it is an Adventist school. 
um, and they are growing there and uh, so again if you can at all help with Lemonisha and uh, with her bill uh, I know that she would be greatly appreciated because she wants to finish up there since she's been there all years so please uh, keep this in mind so again I'd like to welcome to our diverse worship service it doesn't matter if you prefer Fords over Chevys or General Motors over the imported cars. We warmly welcome all those who came here either by car or by cab or by chariot. You are welcome here whether you arrive by bike or on foot. You know Jesus walked all around Galilee and Judea no matter how you got here, we have a comfortable seat for you. So sit, relax, and be blessed by our Lord. Amen. Good morning, church. A happy Sabbath. Let us stand as we sing, Open Our Eyes, Lord. Open our eyes, Lord. We to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and say that we love Him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Let us pray. Your Father in heaven, we ask that you will bless us in this hour of worship. We ask that you'll help us to remove all distracting thoughts and worries from our mind so that we can totally think of you and be blessed by you. So now we ask for the Holy Spirit to be upon us, fill our hearts and our minds with your love and your care. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now time for children's story in our program. I invite children to come forward. I think someone's going to get some more baskets for us. The monies collected during children's offering will go to help support children's ministries, things such as Vacation Bible School, Adventures and Pathfinders. So the kids will gladly accept any change you have. They'll also expect you know, bills, you know, 50s, 100s, you know, gold bullion is accepted as well. So, you know, don't feel for, feel free to not be limited by the, you know, specific on how you give.
didn't put it in the basket. Put it in the box. See the box? There you go. Pour it right in there. There we go. There we go. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. There we go. All right. Can you guys read this? What's it say? Who can say what this is? Us. It says us. Right. Okay. You guys know about the Holy Spirit? Yeah. What does the Holy Spirit do for us? What's it do for us? That's right. It, it's that sometimes we hear it called the still small voice, right? That's how God can sometimes communicate with us. And you know what else? It gives us power. You know, without God, we wouldn't have any power of our own. Satan loves to take away our power, doesn't he? He likes to do stuff to us. He likes to introduce sin into our lives, right? And sin makes it not so pleasant to look at us. When God looks at us, if he sees sin all over the place, because we do little things, makes it harder to see us, doesn't it? Now, does that look as good as it did a minute ago? Yeah, now we got all this, all these little black things in the way, don't we? Do you think we can take sin out of our lives on our own? No, I mean, we can try. And we might be able to do some. But that doesn't mean we can get all of it, right? But then we have this thing called the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit can do things that we cannot do and can give us the ability to do things. It's right here. It says Holy Spirit. Let's see if I can get this to work right. We'll find out. I'm going to get just the littlest tidbit on there. See, does that look like very much? No, it doesn't look like much, does it? But watch what happens when the Holy Spirit enters our lives. What did it do to all that sin? It pushed it away, didn't it? And it can do the same thing for us. And it can do that every day. So we've got to make sure we invite Jesus and the Holy Spirit into our lives. And the more we have, the harder time sin has staying in our lives. And the closer we get to Jesus. All right, somebody want to have prayer? Anybody? Anybody? You want to do it? All right. Okay. All right. I will pray. How about that? Oh, oh, here's a volunteer. I like it. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Please help us to have a wonderful day. And please help everybody who needs help to get help. And please help help everybody in need. Eat it and, fa and all the families in need. And all the poor families and the broke families to help them get to, to help them get money so they can buy so to take care of themselves and to help them and please have all the see up all the people who who don't know you to know you and worship you amen amen all right we got some clipboards with some stuff to do you guys can now head back to your seats thank you
Good morning, church. It is now time for tithe and offerings. Today's offerings will be added to the local church budget. With your support of the local church budget allows our ministries to function. This includes the area of outreach and evangelism, Sabbath school expenses, prayer ministry, children and youth administration, and various church expenses. We worship with our resources because it is a means of trusting God. If you're giving loose offering, please remember to put your loose offering in a tithe envelope. Loose offering that is in the tithe envelopes remains as a church for our local church ministries. Please remember you may safely and securely use Adventist giving to return your tithe and give your offerings. You also cl may click on the QR code printed on the back of the bulletin to give your tithe and offerings. May the deacons and deaconesses please rise for prayer. Please bow your heads as we pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have each new week to sharpen our confidence in you, increase our faith, as we thank you for fulfilling your promises. Amen. When we get them in, we pray over them, and God takes care of the rest. Okay, nobody else has any cards? Hold on. Okay. You're going to bring him up? Okay. 
I know there are special prayers out there that and those also. So please raise your hand to God and say whatever kind of prayer you have in your mind while we're having our, our prayer and ask him for Dear Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit, we come to praise your name. We come to worship you on this beautiful Sabbath day that you give us. And we thank thee for the freedom that we have to do it, dear Lord. We pray over these cards. We pray over all of the silent prayers that are being set out there right now, dear Lord. Sometimes we need some miracles, dear Lord. And you know how we appreciate them so much, everything that you do for us. We are a very giving church, and we thank you for that. We are a very thankful church and a very loving church. We have a lot of faith, dear Lord, and I know, dear Lord, that in this area that we can be a beacon and be a missionary field in Newport, Ritchie, and all the area around us, dear Lord. So fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit so that we will know exactly what you want us to do to get people ready for your soon coming. We need it so bad already, I know. People are hurting all the time. And we'll be so much better in heaven when we're not going to be hurting anymore, Lord. So give us the faith, the hope, and the love. And put your loving arms around us, dear Lord. And help us to have a happy, loving Sabbath day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, Newport Richie. And if uh, someone wouldn't mind giving me my clicker, I think I left it somewhere in that, that vicinity over there. Or maybe it's over here. I'm not sure. Sorry, help me out with that. Um, okay. All right, good. So you guys are doing well? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Well, it's good to see you all again. And let me just, you know, I was gone for a month and. Uh, and it's like, I, I feel like I'm having to start all over again. Like, the, you know, so the other day I had to fill out my address and my zip code and I couldn't remember it. And, uh, so, and, uh, and so forgive me if uh, I have forgotten some of your names, which I have. So um, it's kind of like I have to start all over again. But anyways, uh, I'll try my best. And I also want to say, you know, at the end of the service, I'm trying to, you know, I want to be able to spend as much time as I can with you all. And, and so I'm trying to figure out what the best way is to do that. Sometimes I stay here and sometimes I go to the back door. Or sometimes I'll mingle around the congregate, you know, around the pews. So just let me know. I, I just would love to spend time with you after the service. And so just, uh, you know, just talk a little bit. Good. All right. So um, I just I just want to kind of give a, a a plug again. You didn't find. Oh, you know, I think it's right there. Is that is it right there in front of my backpack? I think, Mark. Oh, there it is. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, that's all right. That's all right. Yeah, you're blind and I'm forgetful. So what does that say about the uh, about the direction of our church? Lord have mercy. Is it the blind leading? What's that saying? The the deaf leading the blind, or the blind leading the deaf? You know. I see. Said the blind man to the deaf man. Anyways. Okay. Good. Well, yeah. So I just I just want to say a little bit something uh, about uh, Lemonisha's offering again, um, and a special appeal that that we made. Um, Lehman, thank you. You know for being here for being here with us. You know as as we were looking at that amount, you know I was thinking, man, forty five hundred dollars. You know, wow, that's a lot of money. You know, but then I started doing the math on this, and not that I'm a math major because I'm not, but I was like, wait a minute, if we just had a hundred church members that could give towards that forty five hundred dollar amount, how, how much would that be per? Per, per, per member, right? $45, right? 
You know, so while the amount, 4,500, seems, you know, just unfathomable, it's, it seems like a lot of money, but if we, were, if we only had 100 people here, which I think we do, if, if we could only give, you know, $45, that, that would more than suffice the need. And I think that's doable. I mean, the other day I, I went to uh, Costco and I filled up my tank and it was like $40. You know what I mean? So, so it's really not a lot of money. If we could just sacrifice a little bit for, for Limonisha, for, for, the, for the family there, I think it would go, it would go a long way. So um, again, if you can make the check, if you're not prepared for that today, but for next week, we'll make an appeal again. If you can make the check out to North Tampa Christian Academy, and then in the memo, put Limonisha Adams, you know, and, and, if you can, and if you can give more, that'd be great. Maybe Mark, you'll give us an update, right, about how, how we're doing with that. So just want to thank you for, thank you for that, yeah. So happy Sabbath, and we do have, want to remind you again, communion. Uh, on Sabbath, September 24, and uh, we do make a gluten-free uh, communion bread so that, you know, we, I mean, it's, it's for everybody, right? So no one is excluded. Everyone can participate in that. So we have communion coming up September 24. We encourage you to be here. I don't know. Communion Sabbaths for me are the, my favorite Sabbaths. I don't know for you, but for me, it's a favorite Sabbath. I know sometimes, like, we don't come because maybe we feel we're not worthy or anything like that, but, you know, the truth is none of us are worthy. None of us are worthy, and that's why we partake of communion. Um, you know, so we can have Jesus' blood and grace, you know, cover us. So uh, communion, September 24, looking forward to that. And our sermon title today is The Other Seven Churches. That's our sermon title for today, The Other Seven Churches. And if you're like me, I looked at the picture and I started counting how many churches are on there. And I was like, wait a minute, there's eight churches on that. And my sermon title is The, seven, the Other Seven Churches. I hope that doesn't bother you. Uh, I was able to get over it quickly, so uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we just pray for your blessing to, to be with us now at this moment as we have sung, as we have gathered here to worship you on the Sabbath day. So Father God, now as we spend time in your word in the scriptures, as we sung in the beginning, open our eyes, anoint our eyes with eye salve so that we may see and open our ears so that we may hear the Spirit speaking to our hearts and convicting us through your word. And so we ask for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The other seven churches. All right, now where's, where's Mimi here? I just remembered something. Talking about being forgetful. Remember that handout, Mimi? All right, do you know where it's at? Are, are we ready? Are, are we ready? Okay, all right. Not yet, but when I, but when I say... You know, when I say it, then, then we'll hand it out. All right, we have a, we have a handout for you uh, later on today, the other seven churches. Okay, so uh, when I started here back in January, um, I think it was January 8, that was my first Sabbath, January 8, 2022, I preached a sermon based on Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus says, and on this rock I will establish, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not, uh, uh, will not prevail against it. And so we learned from that very first Sabbath, when we began this journey talking about churches, on that very first Sabbath, we learned that Jesus established the church, and churches that focus on Jesus will be okay. That's what he said, and I will build my, I will build my church on this rock, right, a symbol of Jesus and a confession of Jesus. So churches that, that stay founded and, and grounded and rooted in Jesus, the gates of hell will not prevail against them. That's what we learned. Churches that focus on Jesus will be okay. And then from there, we jumped into the book of Acts to just take a closer look at that church that Jesus established. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, we learned that the early Christian church, they focused on four things. Does anyone remember what those four things were that the early Christian church devoted themselves to? Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Do you remember that? I know it was a long time ago, sometime in January, sometime in February, but there are four things. Anybody? Anybody remember anything about it? Anybody? Just we'll give you a moment. Acts 2 verse 42. You can cheat if you want to. You can open your Bible and read it. Phyllis, give it to me. Oh, you, you have it on your refrigerator. All right, that's wonderful. Good. Well, I'm glad I'm doing this review then, all right? The church, they focused on these things. The church that Jesus established, they focused on these things, on the apostles' teaching. Again, that's, that's a focus on the scriptures, on the teaching of the Bible, specifically the teaching of Jesus. Uh, they focused on fellowship that is gathering together. They focused on the breaking of bread, eating together. Um, that's why I think churches do fellowship meals. At least we do it once, you know, once a month. I think it says that the New Testament church did it every day. Can can you imagine that? I mean, a fellowship meal every day, of course, different times and, you know, geography was different, all those kinds of things, but, but they, they ate together and then they also 
prayed together. They focused on prayer. These are the things that that early Christian church focused on, and I think that should be instructive for us here, Newport Ritchie, for us. What are the things that we are focusing on and devoting ourselves to? Now, there's also this other word that is used in Acts chapter 2 to describe the church, and I don't think I, I talked about it too much back in January or February, but it says that the early Christian church was also of one accord that they were united, that they were of one mind, that they were of one purpose. And so I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about uh, accord, being of one accord, being uh, unified. And that is that, I don't know if you know that or not, but unity, a church that's united, um, uh, or people that are united, that's actually a learned behavior. Did, did you hear me here? Unity is actually a learned behavior. Now, I know that, that the Holy Spirit came upon them, and, and, and I think the Holy Spirit helped in that endeavor to, to bring them to one accord, but unity really is also a learned behavior. Um, we can't just expect the Holy Spirit to magically make us all get along. Uh, there's a learned behavior to unity, and I think a key to unity is mutual respect mutual respect. Now, someone broke it down to me like this, and it made a lot of sense. They said, they said there's three aspects to unity in a church. Uh, they said the first aspect is relational unity. That is, it's important for church members to just get along, to like each other, right? To, to, so that church isn't just a friendly place, but that church is a place where you have Friends, did you catch that, that that distinction? Right, not just happy happy Sabbath, and then we'll see you later. No, but it, but it, we're, we actually have meaningful friendships here. Um, it's a safe place. Um, there's a place of love and acceptance. Uh, it's important for church members to get along. First step to unity: relational unity, getting along. And part of getting along is mutual respect. Right, mutual respect, understanding that we all have different personalities, and uh, you know, I mean, if I can be honest with you, right, I don't get along with every personality, and I am fully aware that not everyone gets along with my personality either, right? I'm aware of that, right? So, but then we have to have a little bit of forbearance, right, and understanding, and patience, and mutual respect, yeah, giving everyone, uh, you know, freedom and, and space there. Okay, and so the second aspect of unity in churches then is theological unity, and again, mutual respect is very important on this as well, because we are not all going to read the Bible the same exact way. We're going to have differences in our interpretation. In fact, I wasn't really, where's Tendai? I wasn't really paying attention to Sabbath school this morning. I apologize. We were trying to handle other things, but, but I heard that it kind of got a little heated, right? Uh, I think towards the end, there, were, there was something going on, and, and, and I wasn't sure what it was. We're not always going to see eye to eye, but it's important that mutual respect, and I, and I read this uh, the other day, I think it was in Mind, Character, and Personality, where it says, it's okay. Um, I think the idea was that, uh, take the illustration of a tree, right? And there's different branches on the tree, and there are different heights, right, of, of the branches, and there's different perspectives depending on what branch you're at. And so the idea is that we will not all see the scriptures in the same way, but it doesn't mean that we're against the scriptures, right? Are, are you following me here, you know? It's just we have a different perspective. So mutual respect is so important even in our theological even in our theological ideas, but then I, at the same time I was thinking, well, what are those things that do bring us together theologically? What are those things that do bring us together that we are united on? And the first thing that I thought about was, how about, how about Jesus? How about Jesus? Are we united to Christ? Are, are, is he, have, we, have we accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of our life? And then from there we can continue to build relational unity, theological unity, but then also missional unity, how we actually go out into the community and engage in the community. And again, mutual respect is important here because we're all going to go out into the community in a different way. And so sometimes I see churches that they're like, oh, we all just need to get out there and start knocking on doors and, and handing out literature. And then some people say, no, what we need to do, you know, that's old, that doesn't work. What we need to do is engage the community in this other way, right? We need to help them with uh, giving out food or, or community services or helping out needs. And then someone else says, no, what we need to do is we need to go out and give Bible studies instead. And then someone says, no, what we need to do is have an evangelistic series. And then someone else says, no, what we need to do. All right, you see what's kind of going on there? 
these things are not mutually exclusive. You know, we, we may have different gifts and different ways that we want to go out and, and, and work in the community, but the point is we're all working. I, I heard someone, someone say this the other day, and I, it kind of, uh, uh, kind of stayed with me. It stuck with me. He said, um, I like my way of doing things, that is, doing things in the community, right? Being missional in the community. I like my way of doing things better than your way of not doing anything. Did you, did you hear that one? Did you catch that, right? So I think the important thing is doing, right? We may not all agree on how to do it, but if we can be agreed that we need to do something and encourage one another. And again, this is a learned behavior, including mutual respect. Okay, so we talked about that. All right, so this was the church in the beginning, but then we highlighted in another sermon, moving on, uh, we highlighted that there were problems in the early Christian church. There were problems in the church that Jesus established, that, that church that at one time was of one accord, and they were united, and they were, um, and, and they were uh, focusing on prayer and fellowship and, and the, the, the apostles' teaching. There were problems. And these problems were external problems, and these problems were internal problems. External problems, the church was being persecuted. People were actually having to give their lives for their faith. They were having external problems, persecution, and then there were also internal problems. We looked at there were internal problems regarding discrimination in the early Christian church. Uh, there were problems of racism in the early Christian church. There were problems with lying among the church members in the New Testament church. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? They were lying, and Peter says, you haven't lied to me, you have lied to the Holy Spirit, you have lied to God. There was also stealing. Part of what they were doing was stealing. Now, even before uh, Jesus established the New Testament church, he had one of his very own disciples, right, that was stealing from the bag, the Bible says, from the money bag, from that offering plate. He was taking that money, Judas was. There were problems in the New Testament church, and yes, there were even theological problems. Acts chapter 15 highlights a great dispute that took place between Paul and some of the other members of the New Testament church regarding theological, theological matters. But what we learned here, though, is that even though there were problems, the early Christian church did not allow those problems to distract them from their mission that is the proclamation of the gospel, and I think that's important. So I'm trying to think, what are the problems here in Newport Ritchie? I've been here for nine months already, and I'm trying to figure out what are the problems that Newport Ritchie has. Regardless of what problems we have, we cannot allow our problems to distract us from our mission, which is the proclamation of the gospel in the community. All right, so from there, moving on. From there, we looked at the seven churches of Revelation. Do you remember that sermon? All right, we, we did a sermon on the seven churches of Revelation, and uh, you can see them on the map there. You see little Patmos on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. It's circled in purple, and that's the island of Patmos. That's where John was when he wrote the book of Revelation. And then, um, it, then you see on the map, you see these red circles, and those are the seven churches that he wrote to. And so I give you something like this, and my apologies, because I know this is very small. Uh, you probably won't be able to read it. Um, but we put out this chart here, um, highlighting the seven different churches uh, that, that are in the New Testament, and we look at, in the book of Revelation, and we learned that every single church was different. And, and then we also saw how Jesus' uh, approach to every church is different as well. Jesus affirms something in almost every church, Except the last church. Can you believe that? The Laodicean church. I was trying to find that. Maybe, maybe you see a word of affirmation in there. I still haven't found one yet. But it seems that God affirms almost every church, including Pergamos, including Thyatira, which we consider to be an apostate church. But no, Jesus finds something to affirm. They have strengths. But then there's also problems. There's also weaknesses. There's also challenges. There's a word of exhortation that Jesus gives to every church. He calls every church to repent. And then he gives a church, a, every church, a promise. And then, and then I started thinking about this, and I added an eighth church on there. And I don't know if you can see it on there or not, but it says Newport Ritchie on there. And so I started thinking, how would Newport Ritchie measure up to the seven churches of Revelation? Or, or how about this question? How would Jesus present himself to Newport Ritchie? Wait a minute, let me change that. No, how is Jesus presenting himself to Newport Ritchie. What kind of church is Newport Ritchie? What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? 
What is God's message of exhortation to Newport Ritchie? To the leadership of Newport Ritchie. In fact, the, the letters of the, of the seven churches are directed to the leaders of the churches. This is to the angels, to the messengers. So what is God's message to the leadership of Newport Ritchie? What is he calling us to, towards? Our, and, and are we being in tune? Are we in tune with God's word to us? Are we in tune with his promises? Here's another one even. What is God calling the Newport Ritchie Seventh-day Adventist Church what behaviors and attitudes is he calling us to repent of? Something to think about. Something to think about. And so I think now's the time. Where's Mimi? Now's the time. Did, I, did, we, lose, did we lose Mimi? Oh, Mimi? Oh, now's the time. All right, now's the time, Daniel. Go ahead. Or is that Caleb? Sorry about that. All right, now's the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, no, oh, I can't believe that. Jason. Thank you. Look at that. I've been gone a month. Mercy. Lord have mercy. Thank you. Now's the time. Go ahead and hand those out. And so our sermon today is entitled The Other Seven Churches. Open your Bibles to the table of contents. Open your Bible to the table of contents. What are we talking about here? The other seven churches. Open your Bibles to the table of contents. And we're going to be specifically looking at the section where it says the New Testament. Let me know when you're out there. The table of contents is right, should be right at the beginning of your Bible. Open those Bibles up. The table of contents. What am I talking about the other seven churches? We know the seven churches of Revelation, but what other seven churches are you talking about? Do you have it there? Okay, what are these other seven churches? All right, so... If we start with the New Testament, uh, the first four books of the, of the New Testament are what we call the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the Gospels. Those tell the story of Jesus. And then we have the book of Acts, which, which Luke, the book Luke and Acts are kind of, you know, one book together. It's a historical book. But then what is that first book after Acts? Romans. That's right. Okay, that is... That is church number one of the other seven churches, the church in Rome. And then what comes after Romans? Yes, all right. Now, now, yeah, now, now there's two epistles to the church in Corinth. So this would be church number two of the other seven churches, the church in Corinth. That's one church, two churches, Romans, Corinth, two churches. Then we have another one after, Cor after Corinthians. Which one is that one? Yes, Galatians. And that would be the churches in Galatia. This is a, a region here. So we have... Church number one. Someone do the math on this one. Keep track. Rome, the church in Rome is one. The church in Corinth is two. The churches in Galatia would be three. Then we have another church after Galatia. What is that one? Yes, at Ephesians, which is a letter that is written to the church in Ephesus. Uh, is that church number four? Okay, all right, church number four. Then we have another one after Ephesians. Which one is that one? Philippians, that is the church in Philippi. Then the, and then after Philippi, we have... Colossians, which is the church in Colossae. And then we have two other epistles, which are the Thessalonians, which are written to the church in Thessalonica. Am I doing my math right? How many churches is that? Seven right there. Seven churches. The other, these are the other seven churches of the New Testament. Now, after Thessalonians, we're going to come back to the screen here in a little bit. But uh, after, after, after this, you're wondering, well, what about Timothy and what about Titus? Well, these are, yes, these are epistles, but they're not particularly written to churches. These are written, number one, to Timothy. Timothy was a co-worker of Paul, and Paul had some instruction to share with Timothy. Though we do believe that Timothy was ministering in the city of Ephesus. But that epistle is to a worker, to Timothy. Uh, the next epistle is Titus, and that is also a co-worker of Paul. Paul is writing Titus some instruction. Then we have the book of Philemon, or, or Philemon, and again, that is a personal letter that, that Paul is writing to Philemon. And then we have the book of Hebrews, and I think we studied this not too long ago. Did we study Hebrews? I think it was this year, right? That we studied through the book of Hebrews. And, and we're wondering, as scholars wonder, is, is Hebrews, is that written to the church in Jerusalem? Some say yes, others say no. It, it's, it's just writing to the Jewish Christians, no matter where it is that they're scattered. And it's interesting because when you go to the book of James... 
It's also not written to a particular church, but it says to the 12 tribes who have been scattered, that is the diaspora. And so we're thinking that Hebrews was a general epistle that was written to Jewish believers that were scattered everywhere, like James was, written to uh, the believers that have been scattered everywhere. First and second Peter also says that he wrote it to the diaspora, to the believers that had been scattered. It's a, it's a general epistle, it's what they call them. First, second, third John, we also believe is a general epistle, though we believe maybe John was in the city of Ephesus by this time, but, but there is no particular specific audience. It's a general epistle. And then finally, also the book of Jude, our general epistle to believers everywhere. But the epistles that are written in the New Testament specifically for churches is there. Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Colossae, Philippi, and Thessalonica. These are the other seven churches. And so what, what happened here in our journey is that we were trying to explore uh, the various different churches to try to see if there's a message that God has for us through the message of the churches. And we got stuck in Romans. You remember how we got stuck in Romans? I was like, I don't know how we got stuck in Romans because I was only going to preach like one sermon on the book of Romans, and it ended up turning into 18 or 19 sermons, right? But, but the idea here, though, was, this was, this was the idea, um, could, could, we, could there possibly a message that God has for us here in Newport Ritchie 2,000 years later from the, book of, uh, from the book of Romans, could there possibly be a message for us through the book of Romans? That's what the idea was. That's what the idea was. All right, hopefully we we're successful. I'm not sure about that, but, but hopefully we were successful in that. So what I want to do today then is I want us to now, uh, in the next three weeks or so, cover the other six churches. Is that all right? We're going to try to do that. Okay, now quick review here from the book of Romans, God's message to the church of Romans. Now I simplified, I simplified the chart from Revelation. I simplified it to strengths, that is affirmations, challenges and exhortation. Does everyone have the handout? So you should be able to, to read it there, all right? Do you remember? Uh, what were some of the affirmations that Paul shared uh, to the church in Rome? What were some of the affirmations there? Uh, I wrote them down, but even if you remember some other ones, uh, yes, good, right? He mentions that. He actually mentions that in Romans chapter 1. He says that your faith has, has been heard about in all the world, your faith. So that was good, all right? Their faith was a, was a strength. Anybody else? Anything else? Yes. Oh, sorry. What was that? Yes, goodness. Now, this doesn't come till the end. Uh, this doesn't come, I think it's Romans, uh, uh, Romans uh, 14 or 15. I think it's 15, Romans 15, that Paul says, I know that you are full of goodness, he says, and you are full of knowledge, he says, and, and you're able to teach, you're competent to teach. So these are words of affirmation. Help me out because I didn't find any other ones because it almost seems like the majority of the book is written about the challenges that the church in Rome is facing. And you can see what some of those challenges are. Romans chapter 2, the church in Rome had a spirit of self-righteousness, if you see it there. You remember that, Romans chapter 2? Uh, they had a spirit of hypocrisy in the church in Rome. And that's why in Romans, uh, let me see here, Romans chapter 12, where Paul will tell them, let your love be without hypocrisy. There was, there was some problem there with hypocrisy in the church of, in the church of Rome. They were a judgmental church. Um, they were cr a critical church. If you remember Romans 14, right? They were criticizing one another, whether they were eating or not eating or keeping this day or not keeping that day. Uh, they were judgmental. Paul will even tell them the very things that you're criticizing of other people doing it, you yourselves are doing it. You yourselves are guilty of that. And in fact, in Romans, I think, f uh, is it 13? He says that they are actually even walking in darkness. That is their behavior, the things that they're doing. Um, they're walking in, in darkness. It says, you know, it's, it's, it's time to walk in the light. So those are some of the challenges that Church of Rome is, is dealing with. I mean, imagine, imagine being a church in Rome. I mean, what would that look like? I mean, have any of you ever been to Rome? I mean, even Rome today. I mean, I wonder what it would be like to be a Seventh-day Adventist church in Rome today, right? I, I wonder what that would be like, you know? I, I wonder what it's like to be a, a church in the middle of Manhattan, New York City, right? A Seventh-day Adventist church in the middle of, of New York City. Or I wonder what, what it's like to be a Seventh-day Adventist church in Hollywood, uh, not Hollywood, Florida, Hollywood, California, right? I, I wonder what it, what it looks like, right, to, to be a Seventh-day Adventist in London or in, or in Paris or, or, or in China or some of these other large metropolises. What are the challenges that Adventist church members face in these large cities? That was some of the challenges that they faced. And then Paul's exhortation to the church in Rome was the gospel. 
this is what you need to focus on. And, and Paul had not been to, to Rome. Uh, he had not established the church in Rome. But he spends the majority of his, uh, of his epistle writing to the Romans about the gospel. It makes me wonder that if, if what Paul shared in the book of Romans wasn't what he shared in every church that he went to, expounding on the gospel. He says, this is what you need to focus on, church in Rome. You need to focus on the gospel. Yes, you have faith in Jesus, but something is something's not quite right there, right, with that faith. We need to focus on faith. We need to focus on grace. We need to focus on justification, on propitiation, on redemption. And I put there on love. You remember how much, how much Paul focuses on love in the book of Romans. I know sometimes we think about 1 Corinthians 13, right, as a chapter on love. And it is, and we'll get there uh, one of these days here. But in Romans, he talks a lot about love. Romans chapter 5. For God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And even a few verses before in Romans 5, he says, for, for God pours his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And then Romans chapter 8 again, he says, for I am persuaded, right, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then we saw in Romans 12, where Paul will, will talk, was it four or five different words for love? Do you remember that? He says, let your love be unfeigned. And he uses uh, the different words for love there, four or five different words for love. In Romans chapter 12, it's an exhortation to love. All right, so now that, that's just a review. That's just a review. Now let's move on here. All right, so the book of Corinth. So, so who's the church of Corinth? What's, what's that all about? Uh, what's going on there? We're, we're going to look at that here, not today. We're going to look at it next Sabbath. But what I do want you to do now is open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The other seven churches, Rome being that first of the other seven churches, and could it be possible that God has a message to us today through these churches? through these other seven churches. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, do you have it there? Who is the church in Corinth? Uh, what about Corinth? What is this church? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and what I actually want to do is read the first 17 verses of this epistle. Is that all right? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm just being honest. Anytime someone reads uh, a lot from the Bible, I tune out. I do, I tune out. So if that's you, don't do it. All right? And, and as I'm reading, I'm going to say, come back, come back, all right? Come back. Because I do it myself, so I understand. All right, here it goes. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So who is Corinth? What is this church all about? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth. Good, good. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, come back now. Come back. Come back. Focus. Verse 4. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. And, and we have a chart there that talks about the affirmation. So if you even want to start filling it in right now, we're actually coming to some of the affirmations that Paul is sharing about the church in Corinth. You have been enriched in every way with, with all kinds of, of speech and and with all kinds of knowledge, and God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you, verse 7, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift, any spiritual gift, we've looked at that a little bit, Romans chapter 12, Corinth has them all, all the spiritual gifts, in fact that word there for speech is, is, the, gift, is the word I believe for tongues, right? You do not lack any spiritual gifts as you eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Believe it or not, the church in Corinth was an Adventist church. They were longing for Jesus to come a second time, the, to be revealed, the parousia, the second coming of Jesus. Verse 8, 
He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 10. Verse 10. Here it comes. Somebody knows. And so I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. What were some of the challenges in the church of Corinth? I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. It sounds interesting from Acts chapter 2, right? To, to agree, to be of one mind, right? What were some of their challenges? I appeal to you that let there be no divisions. Verse 11. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. Some of the challenges that the church in Corinth is, is, uh, is facing. There's quarrels among you. What, what, what I mean is this. One of you says, well, I follow Paul. And, and someone else says, well, I follow Apollos. And another one says, well, no, I'm, I'm a follower of Cephas. That is Peter. That's the apostle Peter. And still another says, no, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, and so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Uh, yes, I also baptized a household of Stephanus beyond that, but, but I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. All right, we're going to stop there. So who is the church of Corinth? So this is your homework here. Take that chart with you back home, and uh, I want you to read this next week the book of First and Second Corinthians. Is that too much? Uh, you got, I think, 16 chapters in the book of 1 Corinthians and maybe 13 chapters in 2 Corinthians. But just read through it. I'm not asking you to study it and break it down. Just, just read through it, right? Just, just read through it. Don't get stuck anywhere. Just kind of read through it just to kind of get a bird's eye view of what's going on in the church of Corinth. And then also, if you can read Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 18. And it shares the story in Acts of how Paul first came to the church of Corinth and, and some of the uh, challenges that he faced while he was there in the city of Corinth. And uh, so that's going to be your homework. Can you guys do that? Yes. All right. Read First and Second Corinthians. And, and, and maybe we'll even get into Galatians next week. I'm not sure. We, I want to make, I just want to cover it all in one sermon. Maybe we can get into Galatians because I just have a few sermons, a few weeks to, to, to finish off these uh, six churches. So that'll be your homework. All right. Any questions, comments? Okay. All right, well, let's stand and sing our closing song. Uh, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. And uh, I did pick this song specifically because in the book of 1 Corinthians, you're going to find in two different places that the Apostle Paul tells the church in Corinth that, that you are the temple, that you are the temple of God. Uh, Paul was encouraging the church, helping them recognize that they are the temple of God. And so we're going to sing for our closing song. Uh, sanctuary that is Lord prepare me to be a sanctuary and we're gonna sing it twice
Let us pray. Father God, and so as we've just spent some time reviewing these churches, and as we will continue to review these churches, I pray that through the message that you gave these churches, uh, you can speak to us through them, that we can learn how we can be a sanctuary of honor and glory, a sanctuary of holiness for you here at Newport Ritchie. Continue to speak to us, give us insight into our strengths, clarity about who we are, also give us clarity about our shortcomings, our weaknesses, but Father God, may we not stay there, but through your grace, through your love, through your mercy, may we be able to, to heed your call Amen. to repentance and to transformation. Amen. And so Father God, bless this congregation, bless each and every person here. Yes. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you, Newport Richie. We'll see you next Sabbath. <laughs>